Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Tony Jeff with Innovate Mississippi. Excited to have you on what is our third in a series of webinars we've been doing during this COVID-19 crisis. Very excited uh, to have Mike Morgan with us today. I want to also mention Janet Parker is going to be monitoring questions. If you have questions at all during this call or during this webinar, please use the Q&A feature, which is like the chat feature. Uh, we will then uh, have some time where we stop for Q&A, but we really do welcome questions at any time during the um, presentation today. Um, I mentioned I'm very excited to have Mike Morgan with us today. Mike has really been on both sides uh, of the investor uh, entrepreneur relationship, having been the CFO of Baumgar during the time they were raising money and, been, and the president of Baumgar during the time that they were acquired. He's also been a very active investor and mentor to many of our Innovate Mississippi companies. Uh, we, um, as many of you know, connect uh, our technology startup companies we work with to mentors and investors. And uh, Mike has played both of those roles. Uh, he also is a professor of practice at the Department of Finance at the School of Business at the University of Southern Mississippi. And uh, he and his wife, Tracy, live in Clinton. So I'm very, very excited to have uh, Mike presenting for us today. And with that, I'm going to hand over the presentation uh, to Mike Morgan. All right. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, let me pull up a little background information here and we'll get started. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm real excited to, to be here. I've been looking forward to this um, for a long time. I looked at the registration list and it looks like we've got a really wide variety of attendees um, all the way from I've got a business idea, what do I do to people that have, you know, established businesses that have gotten some traction. So I'm going to try to hit somewhere in the middle for that audience and give everybody a little bit of a tidbit. Um, but when we talk about uh, the, the, the topic of what we're, what we're here for today, the, the original concept was let's, let's put something together for entrepreneurs who have made a little progress. Maybe they were working with uh, angel investors, banks, what have you, and then the virus hits. What do we do now? How do we keep those conversations going? Should we keep those conversations going? So if you, if you could see the timeline that I've put up uh, from my screen here, on one side, you've got, I've got an idea, what do I do with it? All the way to, I've raised some money and I've got an ongoing business. I'm really targeting this presentation to the people on the middle of this timeline. Uh, they, they're ready to start networking. Maybe they just started networking. Maybe they were kind of talking about deal terms with somebody when the virus hit and just kind of uh, blew everything up. So if you're on either extreme of that timeline, I hope you'll stick with me. Maybe there'll be some, some tidbits that uh, you'll get something out of. So before we get started, uh, most of what we're talking about here is talking to angel investors. So I need to make sure everybody that, that's on, online here understands what we mean when we're talking about angel investors. And as you can see on the chart here, uh, we've got any number of institutions or people that might want to make investments in private entities, not public companies, but private entities. You've got companies on the other side. These are companies raising money. And so if you're a big pension fund, if you're an endowment, if you're an insurance company and you're wanting to invest some part of your portfolio in private companies, a lot of times you're going to go through an institutional investor, a professional manager that will accumulate lots of funds and make investments in the private companies. Uh, wealthy individuals, um, accredited investors, they too invest in these institutionally managed funds like venture capital funds, private equity funds, and these funds go out and make very large investments. So you're talking million dollars, $5 million, 20, 50, $100 million investments, which is probably not what we're talking about with, with the folks on this call. Angel investors are your accredited investors, your wealthy individuals that want to make investments directly into target companies, private target companies. Um, any number of reasons why they might want to do that as opposed to using a professional manager. Uh, it may be they want to cut out the middleman. 
you know, these folks in the middle here, these venture capital folks, they make a lot of money. They take a big cut of the upside if the deal works out. But a lot of times these individuals who are making angel investors uh, investments, they, they just want to be involved, right? Uh, I saw a stat that about 50% of angel investors are former entrepreneurs. Um, maybe they sold their company, maybe it went public and they eased their way out, whatever. They, they kind of want to stay in the game. They want to mentor the CEO or the founder of the company that they're investing in. So when you're talking to angel investors, you need to keep that in mind. It's not just, I'm going to take their money and go do my thing. These angel investors you know, are looking to have some involvement not necessarily managing the company, but in the big decisions and looking to mentor, they're looking for somebody that's teachable um, and coachable. Um, Tony, we talked yesterday uh, briefly as we were preparing that, you know, a lot of people watch Shark Tank and think, I need to go pitch to some angel investors and raise some money. Um, a lot of times I should be, as you mentioned yesterday, um, maybe the last resort. Do you want to add some commentary on that? Yeah, so I do think that's an important point. Um, angel investors or any equity investors are likely to be the most expensive option in terms of the total uh, cost uh, for companies. So people watch Shark Tank and they think, oh, an investor is free in a bank. I have to make payments and pay them back. But of course, what's happening in any of those equity relationships is you're giving up a piece of the company and so investors really are, in, in many cases, the only option for some high growth companies in particular, but where available banks or other uh, debt is often a much cheaper option. It's just not available for a lot of our high growth companies. And it's the reason why a lot of times companies that are uh, debt eligible and can work with banks, we're usually referring to the small business development centers or others like that who can help them with more bankable deals. Thank you, Jeff. And, and again, if you have questions, if you don't know if this is the right route for you to take, you know, that's why Innovate Mississippi in, uh, exists. That's why the Small Business Development Centers exist. I've worked with Rita Mitchell down in Hattiesburg, and they do a great job. And there's some overlap between the two entities, but they'd both be glad to help you. Um, you know, friends and family might be a source of funds. If you've got assets, you know, that could serve as collateral, you might not have to give up any equity, you know, if you can get a bank loan. Uh, crowdfunding has become, you know, a legitimate way to at least get a little bit of capital on the front end of uh, starting a business. So <clears throat> just because you see it on Shark Tank doesn't mean that's the only way to raise your first, your first round of, of equity or first round of capital. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to ask you is, if you were kind of in this business formation stage, you're looking to raise money, then the virus hit, everybody got sent home. Uh, you have to, you know, you, you're probably chomping at the bit to go get started. You want to go raise this money and, and uh, race out the gate and get started with this business. But guess what? This is a tough time to raise money. It really is. Um, if you tuned into this webinar thinking that Mike Morgan had some magic formula uh, that nobody else knew about to help you raise money during the pandemic. Well, I don't. I'm gonna give you some tips of how to keep things going and things you need to be thinking about, but you really need to think about is this the right time to raise money? Um, does your idea have an expiration date? I'll give you two extremes of what I'm talking about here. If your idea involves something to do with antibacterial chemicals or some, or some application of virus prevention, call me because we need to get started as quick as we can, right? We need to get you to market. Masks, protective masks and other kind of medical equipment. That's one extreme where you don't need to slow down, you need to speed up. Maybe your business idea is um, you wanna open a bar or a wedding venue uh, or some gathering place. And I would tell you, this is a bad time. It's a bad time to raise money. It's a really bad time to start a business that involves a bunch of people gathering uh, in one place. So does your idea have an expiration date? Meaning that if you don't start it now, you'll never be able to do it. You've got to do it now or else somebody's going to do it. If you have an invention and the time is right, I need to go to market now 
And if I wait, somebody else is going to take my idea and do it. If your idea does not have an expiration date, if it's not unique, uh, if it's not something that seems like a great opportunity during a pandemic, I would advise you to just, just to wait. This is not an ideal time to raise capital. There are things you can be doing to be get ready to raise capital as we start to emerge from this lockdown. Uh, and there are things you can do during the lockdown to start, start your networking process. But again, you really need to be honest with yourself as to whether this is the right time to start a business. All right, so you want to keep going? That's great. It's okay if you say, you know what, this is not the best time to start this business. All right. So like real quick, I, I wanted to just remind ahead. people about the questions. So um, I'm not everyone was on at the beginning, but if you do have any questions, please do submit them through the Q&A feature. It's like the chat feature in a normal uh, Zoom meeting, but you could do it through chat as well. There's a Q&A feature or chat feature to submit those, and we'll be compiling those into questions. But please, we will try to answer those, you know, if it's, especially if it's timely to a particular slide or timing, please go ahead and do so. And we'll try to answer those as soon as possible to when you ask. Sorry about that, Mike. No problem. All right, so a couple of pointers here for somebody that's wanting to start a business, either in the middle of the lockdown or as we're emerging from the lockdown. You probably had a little bit of a delay in your business launch and in your fundraising. And this may seem a little odd that I'm talking about this, uh, but get your personal finances in order. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is a lot of big companies now are starting to recognize the need to educate their employees on financial literacy. They're, they're providing training uh, materials or uh, webinars and things so that their employees can get their personal financial situation squared away. And the reason big companies are doing this is that when your personal finances are in disarray, it's the gigantic distraction. Right. If you're trying to figure out how to pay this credit card, so we're going to go borrow money on this credit card to pay this credit card. Then you've got to go look out the window. Hopefully your car's not being repossessed. And it's just, it's a distraction. And when you're not dealing with it, you're still thinking about it. And so there's a productivity loss when employees are dealing with personal financial issues. Well, guess what? If you're starting a business, that's going to consume your time. It's going to consume your attention. And the last thing you need to do is have distractions. And one of the biggest distractions you might have might be your personal finances. So you don't have to have an 800 credit score to start a business. You don't have to have a 700 credit score to start a business. What you do need to do if you're going to start a business is eliminate as much distraction as you can so you can give the business the proper attention. And one of the biggest distracting uh, distractions that could be out there would be if your financial house is in order, uh, out of order. So if you got the $50,000 car payment, you know, car payment on a car, trade down to a $5,000 car. There's little things like that. You know, you're not going to solve everything overnight, but at least try to try to get things squared away before you run out there and start a business. All right, so when you're, when you're raising capital and you're starting to talk to investors, um, what you're not looking to do is, hey, I need some money, All right? Because in this environment, it's, it's, it's likely that you're gonna hear a lot of no's or not right now, talk to me later. You're gonna hear those kind of answers. That can be very discouraging um, and you might get frustrated or even upset because people don't want to hear about your idea. You need to adjust your mindset to some degree and not so much, hey, I got to have this money as I need to network as much as I can with these folks because half of these angel investors in these networks that you'll get introduced to, like I said, half of them are former entrepreneurs. So the fact that they may not want to give you money today doesn't mean that they can't be a resource to you, um, that you can ask some good probing questions about how would they respond to the coronavirus. Um, you know, if they're an angel investor now, they probably were in the workforce back during the uh, 
financial crisis that we had 10 years ago, 12 years ago. They may have been around when the tech bubble bust, busted uh, 20, 20 years ago. You know, well, how, did, how did you respond? If you were CEO of this company, how did you respond to that? How did you raise money during those times? Did you have to lay people off? All those kind of questions. You're developing relationships, right? You're networking. And if you get 20 no's when you're out there trying to raise money, if you can get 10 people that you can call in a few months and say, hey, this situation happened. Can you, can you give me some pointers? Um, and the more people you talk to, the more important it is to take good notes, right? Because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to learn. And if you can raise some money, that's fantastic. Eventually, you'll find the money. But take advantage of all of these conversations to make new relationships that you can go back to in the future, even if you're not gonna raise money uh, from these people. Um, every good CEO I know, you know, there's, there's a part of you that just has to be in sales, right? You're trying to hire, you're selling yourself to potential employees when you're hiring your first employees. You're selling yourself to investors. You're selling yourself to bankers or you're trying to borrow money from. You're selling yourself to your first customer. There is a sales element in starting a company and being an entrepreneur. And you've got to be able to pick up that phone and you can't get discouraged. If you have that one phone call and you get a no, oh, I'm not going to be able to raise money. No, nope. this means you need to make more phone calls. You need to make, develop more relationships. Okay. Um, so as you're dealing with investors, as you're looking for investments, um, I think it's important that you put yourself in the shoes of these angel investors. Um, and what I mean is, you know, somebody that may have been a big angel investor six months ago, um, a lot of things could have changed for that person. Um, the first, first of all, they could have gotten hurt, you know, when the economy turned out. You know, maybe they own a bunch of restaurants or a bunch of hotels or something like that. Uh, their personal capital may have taken a hit. That doesn't mean they don't have a lot of valuable information they can share with you and they might not, they might be a very good resourcing uh, resource or contact for you in the future. Uh, but don't just treat them like either you're going to give me the money or you're not. See you later. You also have to keep in mind that there's new opportunities everywhere. When the economy changes like it has, some things get hurt, some industries get hurt, new opportunities arise, and that's going to divert angels' attention to these new opportunities. And while somebody may have been interested in this idea that you had, now there's a whole lot of more good ideas out there uh, that's grabbing their attention. Somebody that may have been interested in angel investing when the Dow was at 29,000, they may not be interested in angel investing when the Dow is at 18,000, right? They may just stick that money in the stock market. Uh, it's a very tempting time to stick money in the stock market when the Dow's down 35%. Now it's recovered now. Um, but there are competing opportunities out there. And the other thing you need to keep in mind if you're dealing with, if you're already dealing with an angel investor, you've already been introduced to an angel investor, you've had some dialogue. Um, one thing you've got to be aware of is their time right now is consumed with dealing with the companies they've already invested in. Uh, there is a, a angel network over in Alabama uh, it's called AIM, um, Angel Investor M, uh, what's the M? Tony, what's the M stand for? A-I-M, AIM. I'm going to have to look that up when we get off. I'm in, I'm in the network, but I can't remember what the M stands for. But anyway, I was talking to the guy that runs that, and he said about 95% of their time right now is spent talking to the CEOs of the companies they've already invested in. Now that's not going to be the case for three years. It may not be the case for a year, but for the next three months, um, a lot of these angels are going to be very distracted because uh, they're dealing with the companies they've already made investments in. So you got to keep that in mind when you're push, push, pushing to raise money. You know, they've got their hands full with the stuff they've already got. Hey, Mike. Um, yes. I have a question. If you don't mind my jumping in here, this is Janet. Hey, um, 
a question just came up um, about what investors are looking for. Are they really just looking for the next Google or can niche deals get an investment as well? Okay, so we're dealing with people, first of all, and you know, they're all looking for something a little bit different, but what they're looking at first and foremost is a return on their money greater than what they could get in the stock market. So remember that. You've got to, you've got to give them some indication that you can provide them a return that's greater than say 10 to 12%, which they could average in a mutual fund or eight to 10 to 12%. So you've got to show them a return. It doesn't have to be a $100 billion opportunity. Uh, obviously, if they give you $10,000, they're not looking to make a billion. It happens about one in a billion times, but that's not really what they're looking for. They're looking, number one, to get a return on their investment that's greater than what they can get in the stock market. And because they're investing directly in companies, as opposed to investing their money with a, with a, a, a institutional manager like a venture fund or a private equity fund, they're looking to have some involvement. They don't want to just hand you a check and walk away. They could do that with a professional. Um, if they're looking to invest in your startup, they're looking to have a little bit of uh, involvement in the company, plus a return. They want the return. I'd say the return comes first, but they want the return, but they want to have some involvement. They want to be in the game. They want to mentor you and help you make good decisions. Once you've been in the shoes of the CEO, or as the CEO, it's kind of hard to walk away from that. So they like, they like being in the game. Um, but they do want to get, I mean, first and foremost, they want to get a good return. That's a great question. Any other questions before we keep going? Janet? Um, there was a question that came up the, um, in the registration about just how to find investors. Like, how do you, how do you start that process of looking for an angel investor? Is that you, too you ask that you might be you might answer that later in the presentation, but that did come up. How do you find individual investors? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And we are going to talk about that um, in not too long. So let's wait. We've got a slide on that coming up. So don't let me forget to address that specific question. All right. <clears throat> you got to know your numbers. Now this, um, this is a screenshot from a video on Shark Tank. Uh, we mentioned Shark Tank earlier. I tell my students uh, down at USM, you know, Shark Tank's not real. You can't raise a million dollars in five minutes. Uh, does you a disservice as an entrepreneur to think that it's, that it's that easy. But I watch the show because it's funny and it's interesting and they do talk a lot about, uh, about a lot of business terminology and it's, it's for entertainment purposes, I like watching it. So this, this slide right here, these three guys were pitching beer flavored ice cream. And so when we get done, if you're interested in watching, go to YouTube, do a search for beer flavored ice cream on Shark Tank. Uh, it's really awkward because they get these guys twisted up. They don't know their numbers. They don't know how many units they need to sell to break even. They don't know the average units, the average units uh, ordered per store and all kind of different things they're asking and they just can't they can't answer the questions and so I show this video it's about a three minute video show this video to my my finance class that's geared towards entrepreneurship students and I say okay number one objective of this class is when you sit in front of an investor or a lender you don't look like these guys number one uh, but you do, you absolutely need to know your numbers. And what I mean by that is, you know, not, I think if I raise this money, I think I could sell some of these at this price, but I might do it at this price. You, you need to have done your research on the market opportunity. You need to have done your research on price points, whether it's looking at similar companies and other markets, whether it's research that you've gotten specific to the industry, you really need to know your numbers. If I give you $100,000, not give you, if I invest $100,000 in your company, how long is it going to take you to ramp up your sales to break even? How many units do you need to sell to break even? How much revenue do you need to generate to break even? Of course, we're not shooting to break even, but 
until you break even, you're burning enough my cash. Uh, you need to be able to answer those questions. And if you can't answer that question, don't start calling angel investors because that's probably the first thing they're going to ask you. So uh, if you're not comfortable, maybe you're, um, maybe you're an artist, not an accountant. Maybe you're a marketer, not a finance person. That's okay. But there are resources out there to help you get ready so that you don't fumble around because these folks, they don't have a lot of time. And if you get lucky enough to get in front of one of these folks, you don't want to fumble around and look like you don't know what you're talking about. So Innovate Mississippi has resources to help you get ready for a pitch. If it's more of a bricks and mortar kind of uh, business concept that you're pursuing, small business development centers um, have resources. There's one of those in just about every town that has a university in the state. Uh, so there are resources out there. Don't feel like you have to do that all by yourself. But you don't want to end up looking like uh, these guys in this video when you, when you go watch this video. And guess what? Related to COVID-19, now you've got to know what your numbers would look like had we not had COVID-19, which is that's, that's what you were formulating your business around in the first place. But you also have to know, well, how did COVID-19 affect this market? How did it affect this business opportunity? How long is it going to take me to get back to the kind of numbers I could have had had we not had COVID-19. So it's even more important that you know your numbers because you're going to have to toggle back and forth between normal environment, COVID, post-COVID environment, and what are all these numbers going to look like. All right, work on your pitch. Uh, this is important. It should be a no-brainer. It should be obvious, but a lot of times the obvious things are the ones we miss. I got a call several weeks ago from somebody. He said, I hear that you help startup companies and uh, you're a source of good information. And let me tell you about this. Uh, back in 1950, the Navy was doing things this way, but the Army wanted to do a different way. And so then Congress in the 60s said, you got to do this. And the, and the conversation went on. I say conversation. I didn't say anything. I was listening. We got to the 20-minute mark, and we were not to the 1990s yet. And I said, okay, hold on one second. Just look at if I can interrupt just for a second. What are you trying to do? He said, oh, oh, okay. I need $600,000 to buy some equipment to produce this product I've been telling you about because I have an order for this product, but I don't have the equipment to produce it. And if I can, if I can fill this order, I know they're going to order a whole lot more down the road. I said, okay. First piece of advice is next time you pitch this idea, start with that, right? When we talk, talk about an elevator pitch, some, most of you probably know this, maybe some of you have never heard that term. You get on the elevator and you just happen to be lucky enough to be on the elevator with an angel investor or Bill Gates or somebody with a lot of money, and here's your chance. You're going to pitch them this idea. You've got enough time for that elevator door to close and go to the top of the building and reopen to try to pitch this person. So you got 60 to 90 seconds. Um, here's the other thing. If you actually get them interested, you better have your 90 minute version ready also, right? It's like the dog that chases the car every morning, morning after morning after morning. And one day he catches the car. It's like, well, now what do I do? Um, you don't want to be making these 90 second pitches like you see on Shark Tank or uh, you know, making calls to these angel investors and they say, hey, can you be at my office in an hour and let's talk about this opportunity. I was thinking about just that thing and you've got the background and I'd like to hear more. Well, okay, hope you've got your data. I hope you've got your research. I hope you got your financial model built out. If I raise this amount of money, what am I going to do with it? I mean, that's what you've got to spell out for an investor. If I raise this amount of money, this is exactly what I'm going to do with it. And as a result of that, we can sell this much in this period of time. And I'm not making that up. I'm basing that on research, industry research, industry periodicals, my experience in the industry, consultants or other people that are, you've got to have some basis for these numbers that you're putting in your pitch. So if you've been delayed in raising money, if you've been delayed in starting your business, 
then take this time to really work on that pitch. Take this time, if you've never done it, to learn how to do a Zoom presentation. They may not want you in their office. You don't want to be fumbling around with buttons and you know not know how to do a Zoom. Um, I think a lot of us have learned on the fly in the last two months about how to do Zoom presentations, but you get use this time to get ready. All right. Now this is a. Uh, this might be interesting for you, unless you're selling, just exclusively selling intellectual property, which usually means you're selling software. I guess you could be selling music or art or something like that. But if you're selling anything that involves a tangible physical product, or if just part of your offering involves tangible physical products, or even if you're intangible product, you have to have certain things to produce the intangible product. You're going to get questions about supply chain. And this is one of those, this is a very specific COVID-19 item because we're having questions that are raised about supply chains that we never thought we'd have to talk about. Um, if you think about, well, you think about, you can get, you can take, it, just about any college, you can take a course in a management curriculum about supply chain management. Uh, there are some colleges you can get an entire major in supply chain management. Uh, and what we're talking about is, uh, think about Nissan. Up in Canton, you've got this gigantic uh, auto manufacturer up there, huge building, biggest building you may ever see. But it's surrounded by other buildings. And those buildings are not Nissan. Those buildings are suppliers of Nissan. And the reason those suppliers locate so close to Nissan is because Nissan has spent millions and millions and millions of dollars optimizing their supply chain, right? They do what well, they want to do everything they possibly can to reduce or eliminate carrying any inventory. So when they call and say, we need 800 rear view mirrors on the dock at 445, you better be there at exactly 445. They don't want them at four o'clock. If you get there at 446 as a supplier, Nissan charges its suppliers $50,000 per minute that they're late in supplying those uh, supplies because they've got everything scripted by the minute coming down that conveyor belt as they're building automobiles. So the reason I'm bringing that up, that's an example of supply chain management. We've spent the last 30 years uh, in academia and in the business world optimizing these supply chains. When I say optimizing, squeezing out every tiny little cost that you possibly can because Nissan doesn't want to carry a bunch of inventory. They want to carry zero inventory. So they push that down on the supplier. Well, the supplier doesn't want to carry all that inventory. They don't want to top working capital. So they push requirements down on their supplier all the way down, as you can see on this little graph here, all the way down to the raw materials supplier. And they squeeze every penny out of the cost of producing those products. Well, guess what? After they've squeezed every efficiency uh, humanly possible out of the supply chain, all of a sudden there's a lot of second guessing about, should we have left more slack in the system? Should we have had some backup inventory? Should we have had a plan B? Maybe you can't get the parts you need now because the city where they're manufactured is shut down. New York, um, somewhere in China. You may not can get the parts that are critical to producing whatever, whatever it is you're producing. Um, academia has spent a lot of time helping companies optimize and bring efficiencies to the supply chain. And all of a sudden we're thinking maybe that's not the most important thing. Uh, we've seen breakdowns in the supply chain for medical um, items. We've seen breakdowns in the Obviously, everybody want to talk about the shortage of toilet paper. Um, in the food supplies, you've got you've got meat manufacturers who 
have suffered from the virus so they can't produce the meat to get it to the grocery store. There's been some shortages there. So anything where there is a tangible good, where there is actual something that you have to put together to resell, an investor is going to ask you about your supply chain not about how you minimize your inventory carrying cost, but how do you make sure you can get the stuff if a pandemic hits or if a financial crisis hits or if a hurricane hits or any number of things that, that could happen. You know, we, we talk about auto manufacturers. We talk about, you know, big food supply places, but this really trickles down to everybody that's touching something that's, that's physical. One of the things I think we're going to see in the near future, once we pull out of this thing and we look back and we start thinking, we should have done that, we should have done this. Uh, if you think back to the financial crisis, um, after we pulled out of that financial crisis, after all the banks woke up one day and figured out all those uh, bonds they had weren't worth what they thought they were worth, uh, we almost lost several major banks. Uh, the regulators and the feds came in and said, from now on, we're going to, every year, we're going to come in, we're going to do stress tests of the financial system. And they'll come into your bank and they'll say, here's a scenario. Uh, unemployment just went up 10%. There was a hurricane. Um, interest rates are doing this. There's a war on the other side of the world. Run this scenario through your sophisticated models and tell me how this affects your bank. And the bank does that. And then you can tell, are they capitalized enough to survive that? Will they have the liquidity? And the Federal Reserve accumulates all that stuff, not just to see if your bank can handle that hypothetical situation. How is the whole banking system going to handle that situation? And I think what we're going to see six months from now is you're going to see regulators, you're going to see Congress, uh, federal agencies start to look at should we apply some kind of stress test to the supply chain? Especially if you're going to be in the medical business, especially if you're going to be in the food supply business. Let's go in to these major suppliers in the medical industry and the food industry. Let's give them a hypothetical. Let's run a stress test. Will we be able to get food on the table? Will we be able to equip our doctors like we need to? So that's something you really need to keep in mind <clears throat> Those are questions you're going to get from investors six months from now or six weeks from now that you probably would have never heard six weeks prior to the virus coming. All right, so <clears throat> before we go to Q&A, let's talk a little bit about resources. Uh, one of the questions was about how do I find um, angel investors? So if you're asking that question, the first thing I would say is you might not be ready for an angel investor. You really need to do a whole lot of research. There, there's not like this generic angel investor floating out, around out there. Some want to invest in this size company. Some want to invest in this size company. Some want software. Some want healthcare. Some want this. Some want that. Uh, so you need to understand where are the resources to help me plow through this. And so the first thing I would say is this, pot, this webinar is hosted by Innovate Mississippi. Uh, Innovate Mississippi exists and is funded by the state in order to provide resources to entrepreneurs so that they can go out, start businesses, and ultimately create jobs. So it's a, it's a resource that's available to you, and I would encourage you to reach out to somebody like Innovate Mississippi. If you are a more bricks and mortar type of store or you have physical assets, you're looking more towards, can I borrow money? Can I not borrow money? Somebody help me with my business plan. Small business development centers are all over the state. Anywhere we have a university, there's a small business development center and they do a great job. Uh, there's a couple of other sources here of information and I, won't, I wouldn't say these are your primary sources. I would say talking to a real person who has done this is your primary source. And that's what you get when you call Innovate Mississippi or the SBDC. But a couple of online resources I would point to you. Um, SCORE, you see on the screen there, SCORE, S-C-O-R-E dot org. That is an organization of volunteer mentors 
Most of them are former entrepreneurs and CEOs who volunteer their time working with startup businesses. Now, it may take you a while to find somebody like that, that that has background and exactly what you're looking for. I've never used them and I'm not a part of their organization. But if you go to their website, which I will try to pull up here, they have a resource library that is very, very deep and it is searchable. So you can search by, I'm already in business or I'm a startup. There's 611 articles here. If you're a startup, you can then look at the topic. I want to look at marketing, strategy, operations, accounting, finances, technology. Um, there are podcasts, articles, blog posts, videos. So there's all kinds of stuff here at score.org. So even if you don't want to use their mentor program, vast resources there. And look, if you're going to start a company, you need to spend a hundred hours at least researching, reading. The Angel Capital Association, um, the angelcapitalassociation.org is another resource. Um, again, I'm not saying you should call them up, but they have resources in their knowledge center. You can go to their website. In fact, I'm making this PowerPoint available to innovate so they can share it to anybody that wants it. These resources that I'm mentioning to you, I've got them all on the last slide. So we mentioned, mentioned Innovate Mississippi, we mentioned the SBDC, we mentioned SCORE.org, uh, we mentioned the Angel Capital Association. There's several others listed on this slide. One that I failed to mention, Tony, you may be going to mention, maybe you're going to mention this one, is the Mentor Network of Innovate Mississippi. Uh, is that something you'd like to talk about? Sure. <clears throat> so typically what happens when we begin to engage companies is we will assign them each a mentor. And so that's part of the process of determining whether we can get them to be investor ready deals is in trying to find how can they, uh, their team be supplemented through a mentor relationship. And to be honest, many of our mentors, some of them are only wanting to provide just a little bit of uh, advice. Others are wanting to join a team, become board members. And we've had mentors who went on to be asked to be the CEO of companies uh, after working with uh, the startup uh, founders for a while. So that is an important part of our development process is the assignment of a mentor. So, so raising money from an angel or raising money anywhere is just a part of starting a business, right? You still got to have a product. You still got to be able to sell. You still got to be able to source the product. You got to be able to market. Eventually you'll need agents. There's a whole lot to starting a business. Um, besides just the fundraising, even though we're focused on the fundraising here. Since I've got it on the screen, I'll steal some of Tony's thunder here. This is the Innovate Meet Our Mentors page. And you can see here, well, there, I'm assuming my screen is being shared. Uh, there are a long list of very experienced, there I am, very experienced mentors that are volunteering their time to work with Innovate Mississippi they have all different kinds of backgrounds. Some of them are entrepreneurs themselves. Some of them are attorneys. Some of them have a background in IT or marketing or finance or accounting. So if you're wanting to know how do I find angel investors, you know, you've got the resources right here uh, on some of these um, pages that I've shown you. I'd start, I would definitely start with Innovate and maybe get introduced to a couple of mentors that have some familiarity with what it is that you're trying to do. So I'll, I'll make this available after the show, or there's my email address if anybody wants to follow up with me directly. Uh, if I wasn't able to address your question uh, today, which we're gonna have some Q and A, but love to hear from you. There's my email address. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Janet for questions. I wanted to combine a couple of questions, if that's okay with you, Mike. Um, so one of the questions was, what stage are you able to bring on investors? Do you have to have your product done, do you, users, revenue, profit? Really, at what stage should a company expect to then be able to attract investors? Well, that's a great question. And Tony, you're probably more 
qualified to answer that than I am because you see a lot more of them, but every investor is different in what they're looking for. If you've got a concept that uh, holds promise and you don't necessarily have to have any employees, you don't necessarily have to have any sales, but if you don't have any employees and you don't have any sales, you better make a very convincing argument about why you have the background and the unique skill set to bring this thing from zero to 50 in some amount of time. Um, if you're, you know, if you're looking to start a software company and it's, it's, it's doing a service that you've never done before and you've never worked in software, it's going to be hard to raise money if you haven't actually put something together. Uh, but, but if you've got background in it, it's a compelling argument, and you can make a great case, you can get investors very early in the process. So very unique situation that probably depends on, on, on the person and the company. But I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that, Tony. Well, it's always great to ask that question to folks like you, Mike, because I, I think it's very consistent with what we would talk to companies about. I think we would, there's a risk premium the earlier you are, because the combination of time and overcoming hurdles just requires a risk premium the earlier stage. For our companies that we work with, we won't introduce them to the angel network until they've had interactions of their product with the market. Sometimes that's just significant beta testing, but oftentimes that's um, a product that has at least been in the hands of beta users that could become other users. Uh, the, the reason for that is because the validation piece is so difficult. Now, occasionally we'll have someone sort of like you referenced, who's so much of an insider to an industry that they can quickly and easily paint the picture of how even without that product and, and market interaction, they can prove the validation within the market. Uh, and so those might, those are the lone exceptions typically to that, but we want to have someone who's got at least a product to introduce that has been interacting with the market in some way, even if it's a beta. And then generally we would, uh, and that kind of leads to another question that came in. Uh, we would expect that companies should look to delay financing until the risk premium is acceptable to them. And, and so the, the balance of that is if they don't raise money, many times they can't go fast. And so there's a lot of times the case that they don't raise money, they can't go fast enough to really get ahead. But oftentimes, if, you know, the companies that walk in the door with just an idea and no one's going to, no one's going to take 30% uh, equity in an idea uh, for a significant amount of money. The, the risk premium at that point, no one could afford, right? They're basically give away the company for that. And that's not what our investors are wanting to do. They're wanting to be minority investors and invest in that team. And, which leads me to the next question, how much equity should a, an, an entrepreneur expect to give up? Which I know is not a, it's a, it depends question, but that was a question that was asked and I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that. Mike, in terms of having been on both sides of those kind of deals, how much equity do you think is a, a norm in these in this context? Well, you know, the, the entrepreneur wants to give up as little as possible, right? And it's never as easy as it looks on Shark Tank. But you want to start with, I don't want to give up any equity. I'd like to go borrow money. Um, and if you exhaust that avenue, I want to give up as little as possible. Because what you have to remember is, I'm going to have to go back. If I'm successful, that means I'm going to burn through all this money and build a company and then I'm going to go need to get more money and then I'm going to go do it again. I mean, Facebook, I don't know how many times they raised money before they went public. Google, uh, you're constantly raising money because if you're successful, you want to be more successful, especially in technology. You can't grow to a certain point and say, man, what a great company. Let's just stay right here because there's all these people coming up behind you, copycatting your technology, trying to catch you and, and leapfrog. You're always, always, always gonna have to be growing as a technology company, which means you're gonna be raising capital in some form or fashion. So you don't wanna give away too much um, too early. Now, as an investor, you wanna get as much as you can, right? Um, so there, there's, there's that conflict where you, that you just have to work through. Uh, that's where it helps to have a mentor because you may be trying to raise money for a technology company in wireless services. 
I don't know anything about wireless services. I wouldn't be a good resource for you. There may be somebody in that mentor network that's raised money in the wireless business for 30 years and they could probably, it always helps to have people, you know, just about every problem you're gonna come, come across in business, somebody's come across it before. And so the more you can broaden your network and have resources to help people with specific experiences, uh, the better off you'll be. And Mike, we just had a question as well. Um, and I've got another one I'll follow up on this after, but uh, your perspective on safe financing rather than predetermined equity. And for those of you on the call not familiar, a safe is a simple agreement for future equity, which has been uh, a lot in vogue after the Y Combinator had adopted that. So Mike, what are your thoughts on a safe instrument versus predetermined equity? You're talking about maybe, um, I'll, I'll put a note in place that maybe pays me 5%. And when you eventually do go raise equity, I'll convert into that equity at whatever the price is at the time. Um, I guess that's what you're talking about. And I think that seems to be kind of where a lot of original investments, um, that's how they're taking place now. Uh, it just depends on how complicated you want to make it. I don't know how, if you're only raising 40 or $50,000, and you're gonna to have to spend $10,000 on legal fees, that may be overly complicated. Uh, but if you're looking to raise several hundred thousand dollars without giving away half the company, then some kind of instrument like that makes sense. And that's kind of a, any lawyer or any um, financial advisor or accountant that works with startups, they've probably done enough of those that they can give you some good advice. Like Matt McLaughlin's done bunches of those things. So. Yeah, I would say rely on the people that do that for a living and make sure you're in market, that you're not giving away too much and that somebody's not trying to uh, sell you something uh, that's not in established market right now. And, and Mike, I think this would be an interesting question because I know obviously when you were at Baumgar, you found outside private equity firms. What about, we had a question asked, what about equity that's past the angel stage, uh, getting in touch with bigger uh, growth capital or, you know, mezzanine type of capital. Uh, what, what do you, what's your advice for those companies that really pass the angel stage in trying to connect with that type of capital? More than likely, if you're past the angel stage, if you're, if you're, if you're looking at institutional kind of money, you're probably already getting calls. If you're a technology company, for sure, you're getting calls because these venture capital firms, these private equity firms, what they'll make their interns do when they get them from Harvard and Stanford is they just sit on the phone all summer calling prospective investments. Now, a lot of times bankers will bring those deals to the investment firms and you're probably already getting calls from bankers. So if you're not getting call, if you've already gotten past that stage and you're thinking, we're probably at the venture capital stage, we're probably at the private equity stage and you're not actually getting some feelers from venture capital firms or from investment bankers or so forth, you might want to really think about your PR. I mean, how have they missed you if, you, if you're at that stage now? Uh, that's when it's time to call a professional. You, you don't want it. I mean, it's good to do introductory, hey, here's what my company's about. Here's where we are. Here's the market we serve. It's fine to do that with a venture capital firm or professional investor or a private equity firm. If you start talking about terms, if you start talking about a deal, you better have a professional there by your side, like an investment banker, um, because those deals can get very, very complex very quickly, and you don't want somebody taking advantage of you. So it always pays to have a professional on your side. So I think, Mike, in the interest of time, <clears throat> probably time for one more question. I, I'm really curious on your thoughts. In a lot of these situations, we host a monthly Connect event. There are a lot of these face-to-face -face opportunities through conferences, pitch competitions, all of these other, and plus, of course, we do our angel investor road shows, but there are not as many in-person opportunities for that. What do you think companies can do to prepare where they're likely reaching out via email <clears throat> and their first interaction is by Zoom? What do you think companies need to do differently in this kind of remote environment versus what they were doing before where they were seeing more people in person? Well, I think a lot of that's going to come down to networking. Um, you know, if I'm not going to take a Zoom call from you, I'm probably not going to read your email either. But if I get an email from Tony Jeff saying, hey, you ought to talk to these people, 
I don't care if it's an email or a Zoom. So I think it really comes down to effective networking, uh, making sure you're dealing with people who do this for a living um, and get plugged into the right networking opportunities, whether it's through Innovate, whether it's through some of these angel uh, network. We have several angel networks across the state that you need to uh, at least get on Google and, and go look at their websites and see some of the people. There may be an investor in one of these networks who built a company exactly like what you want to do. So it really comes down to you got to roll your sleeves up. And if you're not starting the business now because of COVID-19, you've got some time. Go do some research. Go do your homework. It's about networking. You, you, you may have to make 20 phone calls to get one person to talk to you. Uh, but that's that's just part of the process. So the fact that you may be doing Zoom calls as opposed to face-to-face -face meetings, you better get real good at Zoom, but, but beyond that, it, it's really not that different. Okay, great, well, thank you. Well, and, and I want, it, want in the interest of time to go ahead and wrap this up, but um, <clears throat> Mike, I can't thank you enough for uh, your um, helping today answer so many questions and uh, for presenting this information. I will mention to everyone, this is the uh, third webinar in the series and we are uh, archiving each of these that will be available. And, and Mike, I appreciate you uh, sharing your contact information and email because that had been a question several people had asked about as well. Um, I do wanna mention that specifically in per what Mike said, uh, with Innovate Mississippi, uh, we have uh, for entrepreneurs, the intake form is the easiest way to get started. That just lets us know some basic information so that we can um, then uh, prepare for a meeting to go ahead and uh, meet with them. Tasha Bibb is our Director of Entrepreneurial Development. And then we are a private um, nonprofit. And even though the state supports us, uh, that's a little less than half our support. So we always looking for more support from uh, private companies and others. It helps us do what we do in working with early stage uh, companies and really uh, trying to connect them to capital, make them investor ready deals uh, before connecting them to capital. And I did want to go ahead and mention as well that we have another webinar coming up uh, here in a couple weeks on Wednesday, June the 10th. Uh, and that's going to be optimizing your brand. So uh, we um, are really excited about that and excited about doing these webinars. Hope everyone would be able to join you for that. I also wanted to mention uh, we have a mentor lounge coming up on Tuesdays to so some of our entrepreneurs. If you go through our website at innovate.ms or through our Facebook page, you can register for the um, uh, Mentor Lounge. And I'm getting the text here at the moment. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, email Tasha Bibb. Let me pull that information back up. Uh, if you have any questions or especially if you're an entrepreneur uh, looking to connect with us and please do connect with Tasha Bibb. So, Thank you so much, Mike Morgan. We're excited to do these series, excited to be able to bring folks like Mike uh, to the uh, group here via webinar. And I hope all of you are able to join us with the next, uh, for the next uh, webinar on optimizing the brand. And uh, uh, please uh, do feel free to contact uh, us and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thanks again, Mike Morgan. Enjoyed it, Tony, thank you.